The Saudi dynasty was in power in Central Arabia for almost 150 years before being defeated by rivals Rashidis and taking refuge in Kuwait. A man called Abdelaziz and bin Abdelrahmani Ali Saud, now since trying and ultimately failing to pronounce that correctly would take more than the making of this video, we'll just call him Ibn Saud. He was the son of the last ruler of the Saudi Emirate, just turned 26 and decided to make his own state. In this video you will learn how Ibn Saud unified Arabia into one country, made allies with both the British and the US, and how he used oil to propel Saudi Arabia from one of the poorest countries into one of the richest. Ibn Saud started by raiding Rashidi territory with his cousins, and then, when the time was right, he decided to climb over the capital city's walls via palm trees. He did it during the night and then waited for the morning to kill the Rashidi city governor. It kinda looks like he was so happy with himself for coming up with this idea that he put the palm tree into the country's emblem. Capturing the city of Riyadh meant that some of the former Saudi allies came running back, so Ibn began expanding his territory. The Rashidis weren't too happy about this, so they called their big brother, the Ottomans, and defeated the Saudi. Ibn was forced to turn to guerrilla warfare. After a while, when the Ottomans grew tired of playing with the youngsters, he defeated the Rashidis and occupied a large part of their emirate. During this raiding and battling, Ibn formed Ikhwan, a military organization based on extremist Muslim teachings which made them the most aggressive of the bunch and think of everybody else as stupid infidels. Soon came World War I and Ibn Saud started communicating with the British. But before we go there, just a few words about the Ikhwan and their beliefs. The Ikhwan were a military unit which followed Wahhabism, an ultra-conservative Muslim sect that frowned upon the use of all technology invented after Muhammad's death. In some way you could say they were the Amish of Islam. For example, ISIS also claimed to follow Wahhabism. I mean, they have a few RPGs, but yeah, whatever. The Ikhwan regularly bullied other tribes who didn't do things their way, and when they conquered Mecca and Medina, they frequently beat up the pilgrims, something for which Ibn Saud would later have to apologize to their countries of origin. So back to Ibn Saud, the year 1914 arrived and World War I with it. Saud wasn't hurrying to jump into it, and a year into the war, the British started a diplomatic relationship between the two. Britain gave protection to their lands and also sent money and weapons on a monthly basis. In return, Ibn Saud was to declare war on the Rashidis, allies of the Ottomans. Ibn had other plans. He milked the British for five years straight and then, with way more weaponry than enough, launched the attack and completely annihilated the Rashidis. At this point, Ibn Saud held the whole of Central Arabia but was surrounded by three emirates who all had emirs from the same dynasty. And as you can probably guess, he wasn't too comfortable with this. Also, the British were fairly surprised that Ibn Saud ended 700 years of Hashemite rule in the holy city of Mecca. However, a new treaty was signed between the two and the British accepted all of the newly gained territory as his, while he agreed not to attack their areas around the Suez Canal. To the Ikhwan, the British were infidels, and you know, what good are infidels if you can't kill them? So needn't be said, the Ikhwan found themselves in Ibn Saud's way. Finally, in 1932, Saudi Arabia officially became a country with Ibn Saud as its first king. There was no civil service at the time and Ibn Saud was actually making all the decisions directly by himself. He was known as being a very charismatic guy and with the help of the religious leaders, he forced tribes to accept him as the top man and to stop being nomads. They sold their flocks and started living near desert wells. As doing agriculture in a never-ending desert is not really an optimal way of spending your time, the country was one of the poorest in the world and Ibn was almost a penniless king. Spoiler alert, they found oil. Having invested so much in Ibn Saud's rise to power, the British expected to be given open access to the oil. They were probably astonished when Ibn Saud gave it to an American company. Perhaps the biggest surprise here is how the largest colonial empire in the world can sometimes be so bad at diplomacy. During World War II, Saudi Arabia was neutral and after the war, the mass exploitation of oil began. It brought incredible wealth to the country and very fast. In 1950, Ibn Saud's net worth was $200,000. Three years later, he was getting $2.5 million a week. Needless to say, no more desert agriculture for them. When he wasn't busy running the country by himself, even Saud wasn't sitting down doing nothing. He was getting it on. He had 22 wives and made it count. Father to almost a hundred children, all of Saudi Arabia's kings to this day are his sons. His later years were followed by emotional struggles. He never really cared for economics and the endless wealth was against his religious views. He died at the age of 78 and according to Wahhabism he was buried in an unmarked grave and now nobody can point out which one is his. 
Be sure to like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next week!